Great. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, real privilege to be here. Uh, Jubilee Centre has been so helpful over the years in uh, helping me understand these issues. As an engineer, trying to work out how to work on environmental issues in a social context, a political context, um, particularly striking working on the Darfur conflict and how is Darfur going to govern itself after the conflict um, when relationships have been severed by conflict. It's very helpful to have the relational lens on that. And then later working on issues of food and uh, politics and the environment, again we'll see uh, relationships are, are core to that debate. But as a Christian there was one area where there was particular difficulty I needed to work through and that was is it, if we talk in terms of relationships, are we reducing our interest in the world to the non-physical things? And so that, I think, is a very hard question because you've got Jesus saying uh, that uh, loving your neighbour sums up the law. But in that case, why are we bothering uh, working on environmental issues at all? We're just rearranging deck chairs on the Titanic, as it's crassly put, uh, but often put, you know, in, in, in those terms. So I think it's very important that we think quite deeply about the critique of relational thinking and the environment and look at, I mean, it comes from a Platonic Greek thought about non-physical things being spiritual. And as we'll see, uh, the Bible doesn't say that. So I'm going to talk about two things this morning. I'm going to introduce um, a, a relational lens, not on, on conflict, but on what I've been working on uh, since leaving uh, Sudan. Up until very recently, I've now returned to engineering. I'm designing uh, water treatment works. Um, but most of my work has, has, in the last few years, has been on the, on the question of how we incentivize farmers uh, for environmental practice. So um, that's got a relationships lens. I'll introduce that work and then move on to looking at a, a Christian perspective and how it resolves some of the problems that I found in the social science department. And the key question there is our epistemology. How do we know we know stuff? Is these familiar terms. Epistemology is how we know stuff. Ontology is what is actually there. And we need to think very carefully about those because those are the building blocks on which everything else is, is, is set up. So starting off with this, uh, the uh, National Farmers Union in Wales last year put these big stickers all over their hay bales and um, there were three. Number one, we are feeding a nation. Number two uh, was uh, we're protecting the environment. And number three, we're supporting tourism. So farming, as you may know, is facing a huge transition in this country. There's one very good transition in the way people are farming with a lot more nature-based farming, conservation agriculture. But the big one, which is very problematic and needs to be more of a public debate, is how are farmers going to be funded in the future? And with, with Brexit coming, then the route by which society uh, rewards farmers for what they do in terms of stewardship is going to be turned... Is, is going to be broken and the UK needs to decide what it's going to do in order to kind of rebuild that, uh, that element of the relationship. So we'll, um, I'm not going to go into that in, 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 in detail, but I want to put it out there as a relational question, that basically the farmers, in appealing for saying, look, uh, it's good to have hill farmers, is basically their pitch to the nation, you need us. Even though the people in New Zealand can produce farm uh, lamb in a way that it's cheap enough to buy in this country, then the Welsh farmers are still making a pitch, and they were making the pitch on these three different ways, that if you balance the production of food, the landscape issues, um, and, and the cultural a aspects, and environmental aspects, then you should be paying us. So I thought I'd just explore well, what are the um, relationships that the Welsh farmers are appealing to here? 
and I thought they came in in, uh, in four different ways. One is, the big one is food. So, um, but I think it's as, as low as 8% is the revenue of what you, you, you pay at the supermarket goes to the farm. So actually, when you're buying food, you're not paying farmers, you're paying the food processors and sellers. So the relationship we have with food producers is, well, it's partially with farmers, but it's also with a lot of other people. Um, then I need, uh, and then we look at water. So in terms of the environmental issues, then water quality is an important one because uh, farming produces a lot of pollution. And there's something very interesting happening here. Uh, Wessex Water have, were asked to make a, a sewage treatment works to reduce the pollution into Pool Harbour. And they said, hang on, we could do that, but it'd be cheaper if we were to pay farmers to plant cover crops and reduce the runoff of, um, uh, um, of pollutants, of nitrogen in particular, and thereby we can reduce the nitrogen loading in Pool Harbour to a greater extent for less money if we pay the farmers to do something. Now, what's happened here is if you compare those two, on the first line, we are internalizing the environmental costs by saying, look, if we pay farmers, if we pay enough for our food, then we will expect, we'll be able to demand farmers to live up to higher environmental uh, criteria. That is the polluter pays principle. But we'll see in a minute, people aren't prepared to pay enough for their food for that to happen because the relationship is too distant. So instead, the water companies are saying uh, uh, it's the polluted that pays. And we find this quite frequently, that the re where there's a shorter relationship, chain of relationships, then people will take action. And so farmers are being paid, in this case, by this excellent initiative, Entrade, they are being paid in that way. So my point is, is look at the social contracts, look at the relationships behind the... Uh, environmental problems and from that you'll be able to begin to kind of look at, at policy responses. So some of these are, are um, th there are some big surprises in some of these. Uh, for example if you look at water footprints so you may be aware that it takes 25 litres of uh, to take make a, make a cup of coffee takes 25 litres of water. That's a figure you may, may have heard um, somewhere. I do need to check these. Um, uh, fake news. <laughs> I, I, it's it's, it's 1,000 uh, kilogram, uh, cubic metres of water for a kilogram of, of beef and 25... So, sorry, I'm winging, I'm winging it on, 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 on the figures. Um, but that actually depends, these, these, these water footprints, it depends that works in, um, uh, in society. We know that beef has a higher environmental water footprint than, uh, than wheat, but actually it doesn't work at the farm level because your, your beef may be on rain-fed pasture, in which case you're not taking any water out of the environment, or it may have been irrigated, in which case you are. So it's entirely different. So my point is that some of these big picture relational issues work at the macro level, but don't work in the same way at the, at the, at the, at the, when, you, when you look at it at the, at the granular level. So I was very interested that the, the, the title of the talk I was asked to give was um, uh, about the environment, relationships in environmental crisis. But it's very interesting. What is the environmental crisis? So here is a piece of, it's a thing that we can all, there's no objection. There was, nobody said, Brendan, what are you talking about? Why, why are you going to talk on the environmental crisis? We don't know what that is. Can you not define this thing? But it's a, there's a perceived knowledge of an environmental crisis. And this actually runs through all environmental debate. Because the environment is so complex, it's very hard to get to the 
the, the ontology, what actually is happening in the environment. What we're often dealing with is cultural perceptions of the environment, and that's why uh, you know, what farmers are saying is so important. So just to kind of um, reiterate on these last points about how the relationship with, with farmers is, is complex. These are food pra- f- global food prices from 1957 to 2012. And you can see particularly from the 70s to the 90s a very, very clear downward trend. So that's what I'm talking about, is as society has modernised, as we've urbanised, we're paying less uh, for our food and farmers are under pressure in that regard. And also we don't know farmers ourselves. Have we got any farmers in the room? Have we got anybody who knows a farmer personally in the room? Okay, a few, but that number, I su- suggest, is, is diminishing, the number of us who know any farmer personally. So this, this is my only slide on, on the environmental crisis, and this is populations of birds in the UK by habitat, 1970 to 2016, and particularly to look at farmland birds who have had the biggest decline between 1980 and about uh, 1990 through the 80s, a decline f- of 40 percent, which is horrifying. Now, it's hard to be cited on it. We're not aware of what we've lost because it happens so slowly, and many of us are urban residents. Do we have any rural anyone who lives in the countryside here? Yeah. So, um, and this happened during a period where agricultural subsidies were based on production. Now we've, which was exacerbating the problem I was just talking about, about the problem of externalities. The more you produced, we ended up with the butter mountain and the milk lake and far fewer birds. So now there's been a shift in in agricultural policy to subsidizing environmental activities of, of various types. So you can see now how a relational lens on this kind of makes sense of what's happening environmentally as well as what's happening in terms of, of food. But so that's just put the environmental and, and, and relationships in, 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 in context. What I want to focus on is a little bit more about these questions of relationships and constructed knowledge of the environment. So if you haven't read uh, uh, Rebank's book, A Shepherd's Tale, I suggest you do as soon as possible. It's fantastic. He's an articulate uh, hill farmer who has a grievance that people don't understand hill farming and that at school he was, it was suggested to him that... To get on, he really ought to go and do something else. And he said, well, stuff that, I'm not having that. I'm a hill farmer. And he's now uh, written, this is what it means to be a hill farmer. And this is what he's written. And my point here is that his understanding of the landscape in the Lake District and his way of life are deeply linked. The grass comes and goes with the warmth of the sun The farms and the flocks endure, bigger than the life of a single person. We are born, live our working lives and die, passing like the oak leaves that blow across our land in winter. We are a tiny part of something enduring, something that feels solid, real and true. Our farming way of life has roots deeper than 5,000 years into the soil of this landscape. So if you're a government politician and you're in favour of Brexit and scrapping the role of Europe in the UK, what are you going to say to this guy? Well, surely you're going to reassure him, yes, I understand what you're saying and it's true. Do you see how we're moving now into rationalities which are based on our understanding of the natural world? And you can see this, that, that Michael Gove actually responded in a similar way in the UK government's um, 25-year plan to improve the environment. The opening line is, we are blessed with magnificent and diverse landscapes, coastlines and seas. The environment is one of our most valuable assets and helps define us as a nation. So he's conjuring up pictures you know, of the Lake District on sunnier days than we've got here, and the white cliffs of Dover, 
and a, and a rationality for engaging with the environment. And also, very interesting, our identity. So what we're talking about in social science terms are, are social institutions. This is constructed knowledge which has a rationality of how to behave with it. Here's another one. Has any one of you walked here? On this, on, have you walked? No, no, you've walked here. But have you walked here? On the grass? Have you walked on the grass? You, so we have one person who's walked here on the grass. Okay. But you've all seen this. You've all, you've all seen close to it. So the other day I visited a friend who's a fellow at Trinity College and I walked on the grass in Great Court because he just strode, strode across it and I was with him and it was an amazing feeling. <laughs> um, because, you know, for some reason we just have a very strong sense that we must not walk on this grass. Sure, there's signs which say it, but there are signs which say other things around Cambridge, like no cycling and so on and so on. <laughs> but this sign saying do not walk on the grass matters because it comes with it with hundreds of years of I'm not somebody who should walk on that grass. Even though my grandfather was at this college and could very much walk on that grass, I know that I'm not on the inside of that club. So what I'm saying is it's very powerful, these ideas of constructed knowledge. And it's fantastic that there's, you know, there's this debate of an a, a environmental crisis because some people will say you know, it'll become the, the reality and something must be done. But do you see how it's all linked up with this question of... Of, of knowledge. And where this question became quite acute for me was um, around um, when I went to uh, doing my PhD. As an engineer, I would have a more scientific rationality. But having worked in Darfur during a period of crisis, I knew that cultural understanding of the environment was very important too. So in Darfur, some people will say the desert is moving south and it's causing conflict. Now, the remote sensing doesn't back that up, okay? The desert is not moving south. However, I've never been able to persuade a Darfuri that the desert isn't moving south. And the reason for that is because a certain tribe who lives in the north, the Zagawa, moved, migrated south after droughts in the 70s and 80s. They, they'd say, what do you mean the desert isn't moving south? Why are the Zagawa living in the south here if it wasn't the desert which pushed them? Ridiculous, Brendan, you know nothing. Okay? But it's very interesting, the disconnect that we've got between those. And so now, what's very prevalent in social science department is this debate around... Um, social understanding of the environment and a rational understanding of the environment, which gets kicked out. As uh, Mark Zaitoun, who writes a lot about politics of water, uh, put it very clearly. A conventional physical resources scientist would argue that an objective and measurable physical reality exists regardless of what politicians or philosophers might think. So he's, he's defining, okay, scientists, that's fine, they do their thing. These, these guys are positivists, that's it. They can, they can talk about water in channels, but let's leave, it. let's leave them to it. Because an orthodox social scientist argue that reality is based upon how human beings perceive it and it is therefore quite transformed by humankind. So he's saying that orthodox social scientists reject this out of hand, that that is, it's got no basis in reality. So only thing that matters is these contested, constructed knowledges of the environment. So this is a very, very significant issue and a very hard thing to navigate if you're going to engage on environmental uh, policy issues. Now, I would argue that Zaitun's uh, uh, um, portrayal of a social scientist as an inherent contradiction because he's defined orthodoxy and you know but then he's talked in more relativist terms and that surely undermines the use of a definition of orthodoxy so this I found very hard to navigate as, as an engineer in a social science department because as soon as I argued something from the environment, then I was immediately kind of marginalised from the debate because didn't I understand that it's culture and 
you know, perception is what drives environmental decision making, not science. Now, what was very helpful was that a visiting professor from Norway sat me down and explained that there was actually three ways to, 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 to tackle these questions. The first is positivism. Uh, is the perspective in which observers infer generalizations about the reality by summarizing apparent trends of existing data sets. Patterns or trends are seen to be accurate if further sampling revealed similar patterns. So this is scientific method. Okay. Then we have hard social constructivism, like Zaytun's orthodox social scientist, who constructs the world. You see, posits that social context conditions determines our concepts for understanding the world, and so creates the world, at least effectively, in the process. Things are true because they are held to be true by the socially powerful and influential. So this is very important in understanding politics, that you know, food companies put forward uh, perceptions of the help they're doing to the environment with some products like, ne like Nes Nestle's Nespresso. There's a great environmental story which comes th through with that, but other stories such as the death of orangutans in palm oil, these are all backgrounded. So there is a contest in who controls the knowledge. So it's very important, you know, constructivism, we've got to take it very seriously, and it, it helps us fall into the trap that we really no stuff independent of our own observations that the positivist has. So we're not rejecting this. But there is a middle way, which is a soft social constructivism, which understands that the objective world is real and independent of our categorization. But our knowledge of it is filtered through subjective conceptual systems and scientific methods that are socially conditioned. So this is great. This, to me, was a complete lifeline as, uh, in, in, as, as a stranded engineer in a social science department, as I was. That, that the world exists independent of our observation of it, but our knowledge of it is socially conditioned. So, you know, we're in a generation, and in a, maybe we're in a social group, which is, pre well, we're all in a social group, which is prepared to come and have a discussion about the environmental crisis. Whereas, you know, if you had a different background, you'd say, well, I'm not going in there with those kind of greeny left-wing loonies, or whatever you would, you would characterize the other group. Do you see what I mean? That in the shared knowledge, there is also an identification of, we are people like this who see things this way. So those who walk on the grass at King's, it's, they are part of, they're showing that they behave in a way that they are part of the club. And those of us who are not in that club must behave in a different way. So there are power dynamics as well here. Okay, so now we've, we've set out some of these quite difficult building blocks. We're now in a position, in quite a different position, to be able to start to talk about a Christian environmental ethic. So first of all, we're going to say, okay, well, where does a Christian fit with these? Um, we're just coming on to that, but this, this slide first. I just want to kind of dr drive home this question of um, uh, moral ecological rationality. In this case, a moral ornithological rationality. Does anyone know what this picture is? Okay, for easy question, who did it? Banksy. Okay, next question. When did he do it and where did he do it? 2015. Okay, why and where? Through the migrant, European migrant crisis. Yeah, and do you know where? Essex. Yes, Essex. Clacton. And do you know why? Because it was just before a by-election in which there was this UKIP M MP. And so you can see very, very clearly he's, he's appealing to a, a moral, ecological rationality of us. He's, he's saying, look, you can see the world, surely, and you can see how birds migrate from Africa to, to Essex. Surely every African should be able to do that, not just the winged, one, winged ones. So he's making a moral point from the world around him. Now, this quote you're probably more familiar with. 
And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow. They do not labour or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendour was dressed like one of these. If this is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and is thrown into the fire, will he not more clothe you, you of little faith? So Jesus likewise appeals to a moral ecological rationality. Jesus says, look at the birds, understand from the birds, as does Banksy. So therefore there's something fundamentally human to our activity of reading the natural environment and drawing lessons for social interaction from it. So just to go back then to, to Rebank, so Rebank said, no, look, the Lake District, it's not about recreation, it's about, um, it's a real farming landscape. Whereas there are other people, and you'll be familiar with this in, in literature, people like, uh, I mean, Arthur Ransom was, was one of the classics in terms of, you know, the goodness of, of the English country, uh, countryside that Michael Gove was tapping into. And, and with Ransom, he was talking about the Norfolk Broads, and there were these wholesome kids who went round and had wholesome adventures, and then there were these hullabaloos who came up from London and had loud music on boats which is clearly wrong. And it's true when you go punting as well, and just so you remember that. No loud music on boats. But, <laughs> so you can see that actually in the Lake District you've got these two moral ecological ra rationalities, and they're inter different people are interpreting the same landscape, one for recreation and one for farming. So, but the thing is, we see in the Bible, we see both of these. So, is the Lake District a recreational landscape? Well, David says, yes. The Lord is my shepherd, I, I lack nothing. He lets me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. I've had more holidays in the picture in, in, in exactly this location than anywhere else, and I can vouch for that. It's a very restful place to be. And so, as a Christian, then I'm thinking, yes, there's a constructed cultural rationality here, but there's also a, a Bible theological truth here. So we've got to look at that interface. But similarly, we can see that this is also a farming landscape. He waters them, and this is Psalm 104. He waters the mountains from his upper chambers. Heaven knows he does that in the Lake District particularly when we're on holiday. The land is satisfied by the fruit of his work. He makes the grass grow for the cattle and plants for the food to cultivate, bringing forth food from the earth, wine that gladdens human hearts, oil to make their faces shine, and bread that sustains their hearts. Then people go out to their work and labour till evening. So, sure, there is, you know, there's... Um, and this is where it's very important that we don't kind of say constructed knowledge well that's all that's not true because actually there's something true something can be true and non-physical the most helpful book i've read on as a christian environmentalist was actually christopher ash's book on marriage because he looks at genesis 2 and says how do we understand that and he says marriage is a social institution but it's a true one it's ontological it exists so, as a Christian, then we, we don't just, we have this, there are some aspects of culture, say Christmas on the 25th of December, which is culture and that's fine and we accept it's culture, but there are some aspects of, of very similar knowledge, which is true, Jesus was born. So we wouldn't say that Jesus' birth is a social construct, we would say, well, it's very similar in terms of its knowledge that we hold together, but we've given a, it's got an authority from God. So very soon we're going to have to start talking about relationships here, um, in terms of who um, creates knowledge. And just to kind of make this point about, you know, that we can actually be comfortable with this territory. We don't need to panic at this point that some things are made up, i.e. made up together, therefore culture and other things are invisible but still true. As a Christians, we don't have a problem with that. So take, for example, Genesis. That 
it starts off by saying, and God said, let there be light, and there was light. God saw that light was good, and he separated light from darkness. He called the light day, and the darkness he called night, and there was evening, and there was morning, the first day. So light exists. God says it's good. It's something which is there, and we can study it as, as waves, as, you know, in, in its scientific context. So we can take a, a, a positivist scientific approach to light. A, a cultural kind of uh, approach you'd find in literature as well, so poetry, um, John Donne and others. Um, the Lord looked at the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. And later on it says, Now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the wild animals and all the birds in the sky. He brought them to the man to see what he would name them, and whatever he named the man called each living creature, that was its name. So the man gave names to all the livestock the birds in the sky, and all the wild animals. So God mandates the creation of culture here. It's for us to make science. And it's not independent of God. He has, after all, put us in the Garden of Eden to work it, and in the, in the world to work it. So it's part of our relationship with God is to work across science and culture. So, in technical terms, culture, science is part of culture. So, therefore, this whole idea of how we understand things, well, it's something that we do collectively, so there's a relational aspect there, but it's also something we do in terms of our relationship with God. He's told us to do science, we go and do science. And it's something that's rightly done with an understanding of we're in, in God's world. So, just to kind of... Um, take this a little bit further, is that if we are talking amongst ourselves and generating knowledge of the environment, well actually so is God, because God is a trinity. And you know God made the world, but what about the Holy Spirit's role in this? What about Jesus' role in this? So all creatures, in Psalm 104 again, all creatures look to you to give them their food at the proper time. When you give it to them, they gather it up. So God's relationship with the world. When you open your hand, they're satisfied with good things. When you hide their fa your face, they're terrified. So this is a vertical relationship. When you take their breath away, they die and return to dust. When you send your spirit, they are created and you renew the face of the ground. So this has been the most important verse for me as a working environmentalist to understand God is active in the world, sustaining everything. This tree's out here, none of those germinated without God's active engagement. But it's the Holy Spirit doing this here. So if we've got God the Father overseeing the whole, the whole shebang, we've got the Holy Spirit active in the germination and the assistance and the food provision of, of all the animals. And then, uh, as Paul explains to the Colossians, the Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. So it's actually, a, it's a beautiful idea here that God the Father has had these two huge projects that he's done with his boy, okay? God the Father gave it to God the Son to create the world. The other big project? Redemption. So God the Father gave it to his Son to redeem the world, to take our place on the cross. So you can see we can't talk about God and his interaction with the world without talking about the the Trinity. So it's, if you've got these three parts of the Godhead in relationship, creating knowledge, and you've got us made in God's image, well, what do we do? We live in God's world, talk with each other, and create knowledge. So uh, that's why Prabhupada was right to say relationships run through absolutely everything. And now we're in a much better position in order to... Um, to ta start to tackle these questions about epistemology and um, in terms of how to navigate an environmental debate, these things are essential. Because if you wade in on the scientific evidence, you will speak to one constituency, but the people who are more politically and culturally minded, you'll lose them. 
Whereas if, on the other hand, and I've seen this happen, I've been part of a debate where I was, we were talking about the politics of water, and I was t told that water flows to money and power. That's fantastic. If you can't explain the, the, the geopolitics of Egypt without looking to see where the money goes, it goes to, to, the, to money and water goes to money and power. But then you can't, at the same time, reject the hydrological cycle. You've got to keep both of these things in, in play. But now... We're beginning to come, by having this soft social constructivism, we have a means of engaging, of navigating that debate. But as Christians, we know that some elements of our worldview are ontological, they're true, they're given to us by God, such as the value of human nature. So this, you know, these, what I'm talking about in these two slides, for me was the most exciting part of doing my PhD, because it resolved a huge question that was debate, which was completely polarised going on around me. I was able to engage as a social scientist, as, a polit uh, as an engineer slash social scientist, by taking this soft social constructivism, and I could reconcile it with a Christian epistemology by saying, yeah, you don't actually know this, but some of these bits are which you could call a worldview, are actually true. So I love this quote from, from Lewis, C.S. Lewis. I believe in Christianity as I believe that the sun has risen. Not because I see it, but because I see everything else by it. So uh, that then is key to kind of navigating uh, this area. So once we've, we've We've, we've gone quite a long way in putting some building blocks in place here, but what I want to do is, as we kind of draw, draw things to a close, is to say, okay, well, what is a Christian environmental ethic? What is a Christian environmental um, rationality? And it starts off by, you know, by locating the whole thing in our relationship with God. And you know, Adam was made from the earth. Do you know what Adam means? Anyone know the Hebrew Adam, Adama? Anyone? Uh, yeah. So, so we, we're dealing with a hunter-gatherer whose name is Soil. And so we're not really in a position to go down the platonic route and say it's only non-physical things that matter. Because otherwise, why did God call the first man Soil? So... Having said that, we can't understand these things without thinking in terms of, of relationship. And, but now we can say that we understand our role in the world as tenants of God, we're, we're tenants in God's world, and we should be understanding things from that process. And as predominantly urban people with a modern mindset and modern food production, we are very seriously divorced. So we're greatly impoverished by not understanding things which Jesus and his followers would have taken for granted because they lived closer to the environment. So just to kind of argue that we do need to understand the world in order to understand more fully what it means to be human in the world, here are some examples. Um, Abram uh, was taken outside and said, look up at the sky, this is God talking, look up at the sky and count the stars, if indeed you can count them. And then he said, so shall your offspring be. So God pointed Abraham to the world and said, look, I want you to understand me. Understand what I've made and understand me together. And with Job, I mean, the fantastic story of Job where, you know, he's got all kinds of very valid complaints, but then he demands God for an answer. He says, right, OK, I now this is it answer and and God does answer and he says then the Lord spoke to Joseph out of the storm he said who is it that obscures my plans and words without knowledge and then you got these fantastic description of the natural world with you know big beasts in the sea and on the land and there's a lovely bit of humor in the middle of it about um the ostrich where God says and look at the ostrich have you ever seen such a dumb bird as the ostrich which can you know it doesn't look great the peacock's better looking than the ostrich it's so stupid it plant it just lays its egg on eggs on the ground I mean how dumb can you get but actually it can outrun a horse so God is, is, is appealing to Job to think 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 reflect on the natural world and then reflect on me. And this 
understanding these things was the means by which Jesus, uh, Job was able to understand his context. And um, so I've put in Romans here and just put in the key word in the middle of it. Where, where does this come? Anyone recognise this from, from Romans? Yes, Romans 12. Well done. Let's see, 10 out of 10, Bible knowledge. Um, yeah, because this is the hinge of Romans. You've got, well, you've got nine, uh, uh, um, eight, nine chapters of worldview, including an element of looking at the world and drawing moral re- lessons from it. Then you've got a couple of chapters on, on um, who's included in this worldview. So it really is setting up a social institution. And then, boom, therefore. And then you've got the remaining chapters, remaining four chapters on this is then is how you should live. So this is a profoundly Christian way of of looking at the world, understanding our our context, understanding God's role in it, and living in light of that. And this lovely quote, so the Victorians were stronger in, in, in this area with some of the, the poets Cooper and others writing about the natural world and this lovely quote from Jane Austen in Fanny Price who is a fascinating character she's really a, a it's a thought experiment Mansfield Part is a thought experiment for Jane Austen's heroes of she, just, she writes she creates Fanny Price who has immense integrity, but very little else to attract you to her. And it's an extraordinary book. And so Fanny Price, fantastic character, fascinating. And in the middle of it, one of the things Fanny says, she clearly has a a, a clear uh, um, moral, ecological rationality that chimes very well with a Christian. Here's Harmony, she, she said, Here's repose. Here's what may leave all painting and all music behind and what may tranquilise every care and lift the heart to rapture. When I look out on a night such as this, I feel as if there could be neither wickedness nor sorrow in the world. And there certainly would be less of both if the sublimity of nature were more attended to and people were carried more out of themselves by contemplating such a scene. So people have been behaving quite badly in the in the in the book, and Fanny Price gets some some solace by looking up at the stars. And it's just fascinating to think. Well, you know, as urban residents, <coughs> we don't see the stars. I'm fortunate enough to have lived in the desert, and I've seen the stars. It's completely another thing when you're away from urban residents. And some of you may may have sailed, will have seen the same. And interestingly, throughout the Old Testament, you know, this is typical that the, uh, of the prophets. Um, okay, I have to draw it to, draw it to close. One more, one more slide to go. Um, throughout the prophets, God points to the natural world as the fabric in which he's put these people to live. And... Um, We've got this quote from Hosea. Hear the word of the Lord, you Israelites, because the Lord has a charge to bring against you who live in the land. There is no faithfulness, no love, no acknowledgement of God in the land. There is only cursing, a lot, lying and murder, stealing and adultery. They break all, break all bounds and bloodshed follows bloodshed. Because of this, the land dries up and all who live in it waste away. The birds of the field and the birds in the sky and the fish in the sea are swept away. So the... The fabric that God, as our landlord, gives us is something that we as tenants have a responsibility to look after, but also there's an element of, you know, this is something given by him, and he, has, he can give us more or less of it as well. He can bless us with it. Now, many of us say grace at mealtimes, but we're actually very divorced from a real gratitude for our farm, for, for the work of farmers, because we haven't lived with the uncertainty of whether we'll have food or not. So there's that, and there's the fact we no longer really see the stars. You know, modernity has divorced us from a Christian understanding in quite a number of ways. That's not to say it's wrong, but it is to say that we need to redress that balance. So final slide is just to look at in terms of, okay, what did Jesus say about all of this? And what is the worldview that we have 
now living, we can't just go back to Genesis and say, well, we've got, we're living in a perfect world and it's broken. We, you know, how do we flip-flop? Well, there's a risk of flip-flopping between, well, it's all broken and it's a crisis, or it's a perfect world that's been given to us by God. And one of the very interesting things in the New Testament, you'll be familiar with, you know, the Sermon on the, Mi- on, on the Mount, and the st- what is the standard Jesus appeals to in our behaviour on the Sermon on the Mount? How good is good enough? Be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. And how can he make that? What's the, what's the rationale that he can, he can make that? Well, it's because as, as the creator of a perfect world, he can say this is how life is. He's got an authority over, to appeal to a perfect world. And then he lives up to that perfect world. So Jesus' life is explained about a perfect person living to the standards of an unfallen world in the grim reality of a broken world. That's how you understand Jesus' ethical behaviour. What's fascinating is to see that with respect to the national environment. When he was in temptation, Mark points out he was with the wild animals and the angels attended to him. Um, And in Matthew, uh, the disciples, uh, you know, when he's uh, crossing the sea of Galilee, the disciples went and woke him saying, Lord, save us, we're going to drown. He replied, you of little faith, why are you so afraid? He got up and rebuked the winds and waves and he was completely calm. So the interesting thing there, A, number one, is that he could uh, calm the sea. Okay, That you're probably kind of familiar with. Interesting thing number two, why on earth was he rebuking the disciples? On what basis should the disciples have got it that... Well, why should they get in the neck for saying, could you do something about this, we're about to sink? Well, it's because Jesus, by this stage, was expecting them to have an, an, a worldview informed by perf- a perfect world. He was saying, no, you haven't got it. You're with me. How can the world do any harm to you? How can the natural world be broken if you're with me? You haven't got it. So you can see, again, many other examples. The raising of Lazarus. No, Jesus knew what he was going to do beforehand, but it was with Jesus. So, of course, he's going to come back to life. Um, And, you know, when he's asked by uh, John the Baptist's disciples who he is and so on, uh, he'd been doing a lot of healing, and he replied to the messengers, go back and report to John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, and those who have leprosy are cleansed. The deaf hear, the dead are raised, and good news is proclaimed to the poor. So it's very clear that Jesus' ethic and his environmental ethic is informed by a perfect world. Which brings me to Schaefer's comment that the church is a pilot plant of a redeemed humanity. So if we're trying to work out environmental policy or environmental situation, then we respond, maybe there are Christians who are saying, look, what are you doing? You should just be doing evangelism and not worrying about these issues with the physical world. But our response there is to say, hang on, Jesus' environmental ethic is informed. We are redeemed people and therefore we should be living as if the world, in this regard, as if the world has not fallen. We should be living up to the responsibilities we were given in Eden. So that is our environmental ethic. And just to kind of drive this point home, amazing that Jesus, when he goes into Jerusalem, he goes on a donkey that has never been ridden before. So this donkey hasn't been broken in. All of a sudden, this donkey that hasn't been ridden is able to ride calmly through these crowds who are waving these big branches around and having a party. So Jesus, he demonstrates this reconciliation with nature in that way. So there you have it as the environmental ethic, and it all fits in with this context of relationships. And, you know, just to kind of recall that, uh, that diagram about food, you know, how do we... How do we um, incentivize the farmer to be environmental stewards and to feed us? Well, we put it in, in this context of our relationship with the farmer and God's relationship uh, with us. 
So just then to, to leave you with, with this slide saying, Now the Lord God had planted a garden in the east, in Eden, and there he put the man he had formed. The Lord God made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground, trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. So the dual role of farmers remains. They're environmental stewards and they feed us. And our responsibility to them for doing these things for us can be seen in relational terms through food policy and through the way we interact in the countryside.